breakout dinners. And it's, a very, it's actually a very, very special one. Um, for the last uh, number of years uh, in person, but then at least one edition virtually, we've partnered with Intelligence Squared uh, to organize a very special series of debates around topics that are critical to our conversation. Uh, and today we have a debate around the question of should we isolate Russia? Uh, it's a very special format and uh, it'll be explained to you. Uh, but just to say we're really delighted to be cooperating again with Intelligence Squared. Uh, we were talking before I came in here about why this is important to the two of us. And I, I think it boils down to this. I think the combination adds a very special value for our participants here, but also for the bigger audience that will see this. Um, so we're very happy to be collaborating again. And we're very happy to have uh, David Ariosto with us, host of Intelligence Squared, to explain the format, to moderate the debate. David, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for sticking around here for the last events of the forum. I'm David Ariosto. I'm the head of editorial of Intelligence Squared, also your host and moderator for tonight. But before we get started, I just want to thank the German Marshall Fund for having us here to do this all-important debate. You know, it's, it's something because of the timeliness of this, of this topic that, that we wanted to focus on. Obviously, Ukraine and Russia are topping the headlines um, very much uh, every day. And but the place, the place of where we're at is also highly relevant. NATO is just right up the road here. Um, SWIFT banking system, which several Russian banks were, were banned, uh, is also headquartered here. And President, President Vladimir Zelensky came here after his inauguration to petition for EU membership and for NATO membership. Um, it's also a place that is very much steeped in history in a broader sense. I know from a, from a personal perspective, my grandfather was wounded here um, back in 1944 um, during the last major German offensive of the Second World War, the so-called Battle of the Bulge. And I remember him describing just how cold he was, sleeping on the frozen ground in December of the snow. And it got me thinking about the sacrifices that the men and women made during that, during that conflict. And only a couple years after that war, NATO was established with the intention of keeping war from Europe's shores. And yet here we are about to debate what to do about yet another war on the European continent. And yet another winter is also coming, this time perhaps without the benefit of some of that Russian energy upon which many have relied. So that is part of the reason we wanted to do this debate. And we put together a bit of an explainer to detail the back and forth as to why. So I'll let you watch right now. At the time Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, Europe was among Moscow's biggest energy customers. Not just coal and natural gas, but one third of Europe's oil also came from Russia. In fact, the Kremlin plays an outsized role in world oil markets, accounting for about 12% of global trade. But with sweeping sanctions as a result of the war, much of that is in question. So is this campaign to isolate Russia ultimately a good idea? Those who argue yes say the Kremlin must be punished and that accommodations only embolden Moscow. Those who argue no say isolation is a dangerous gamble that could disrupt Europe's economies, influence its politics, and risk escalation. In tandem with the German Marshall Funds, we debate this question. Should we isolate Russia? So yes, that is the question, should we, the transatlantic partners, that's defined as we, isolate Russia? Now, keep in mind, this Intelligence Squared debate is not just for this forum here. We're also a radio show on National Public Radio. So the forum that you see here, everyone that's benefiting from this discussion, the debate, it's not just you. <laughs> this will also reach an, an audience of millions in the United States when, it, when it's later broadcast, and you certainly are going to be a part of it. 
Um, you're going to vote twice. I'm just going to go a little bit how this is all going to work. You're going to vote twice on this. You'll be getting a push notification right now where you can just scan the QR code that's right behind me here. And essentially, you're going to be voting on how you feel about this motion now before you've heard the arguments, and then you're going to be doing it again in about an hour's time after you've heard the arguments. And I, I will say this, that part of our mandate is bringing civil discourse and debate through civility and a willingness to have an open mind. So as you go into this discussion, as you go into this debate, have an open mind. Think about what, what the arguments are, and you know, we'll see where you stand at the end of it. Um, when you click on that QR code, you have three options, yes, no, or undecided. And the question, obviously, is should we, the Transatlantic Partnerships, that's how we define we in this context, isolate Russia? So let's go ahead and now meet the debaters. So first up, arguing yes to the question we should isolate Russia is Bulgarian politician and European Parliament, Radan Kanev. Next up, his partner, former ambassador to, the, to, uh, to Russia, U.S. Ambassador, Michael McFaul. <laughs> Their opponents, Jonas Scheinde, chief economist and uh, Russia specialist. <laughs> and joining us via Zoom, Emma Ashford of the Atlantic Council. So the way this is going to go is each debater will have their time in turn to give an opening statement, three minutes in length. And the first up is former ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall. Michael, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Um, usually, this is when we say, I'm so delighted to be here. Uh, I'm not delighted to be here. Uh, I don't want to be here. Uh, I'm not a professional debater. Uh, these are really tough questions. And thank you for reminding everybody I'm a former ambassador, but I'm a, a real professor. I've been a professor most of my life. We don't speak uh, uh, extemporaneously like this. I was told to wander around. David coached me in this, right? We don't do this this way. Usually there's an audience there. Usually there's a podium here. Usually there's slides here. Uh, that's how I normally talk. And usually we speak in 100 minute intervals, not three minute intervals. So <laughs> I am not delighted to be here. Uh, but I'm here anyway, and I'm going to try to make three arguments in three minutes. Uh, before I get to that, you already defined the we. Thank you for that, because I was sh uh, not sure what the we is. I want to be clear for me, and I'm not saying this is for the rest of our uh, guests today. For me, Russia in this debate is Putin's regime, it's not Russians. I don't believe in isolating Russians. I don't want to be very clear about that. The arguments I'm making is about Putin's Russian regime today. I'm not arguing about 300 years of history, although we're going to get into some history. Those are my definitions. And three minutes, oh my god, the clock already started. I didn't start my remarks yet, David. <laughs> I've already lost 30 seconds. All right, three arguments in three minutes. One, I believe that for the transatlantic partnership, the United States, the liberal world, the free world, Isolation is the better strategy to achieve our national and, and international interests than all the alternatives. And I want to be clear about this. There's a lot of confusion sometimes, well, certainly when I worked in the government for five years about means versus ends. Isolation is a strategy to achieve something, as is engagement. It's important to define what are you seeking to achieve? What are your objectives? And I would not, I, this has changed over time, over decades for my country, but I would argue today for the objectives that are most important for the United States of America vis-a-vis -vis Russia, isolation helps us achieve our objectives better than engagement. So building a free and sovereign Ukraine, does engagement with Russia or isolation help us achieve that end? Obviously, in my view, isolation is better for achieving that. Uh, dealing with China. Isolation, in my view, helps us achieve our long-term objectives vis-a-vis -vis China rather than engagement with Russia. Energy security. I actually, I was in the Obama administration. I worked in the campaign. We, I wrote a memo in the fall of 2008 why we should seek energy independence from Russia. Um, and because we still believed in engagement, we didn't do that. Today, I think it's crystal clear Isolation helps us achieve that objective, and maybe in questions we'll get into others. 
Two more arguments I want to make as the clock ticks very quickly. Um, second, if you're going to argue for engagement, and I'm just dichotomizing in the interest of time because there's a, it's on a spectrum, but if you're going to argue for engagement, there are costs to engaging Mr. Putin today, particularly, I would say, to the values that we've been talking about in this conference for the last two days. And particularly, I would say, for Europeans who do not have the same baggage that Americans do when talking about values. Are you going to normalize annexation in the name of getting along with Putin? Are you going to forget about human rights and shake the hands of the guy that slaughtered millions, of, not millions, hundreds, thousands of people in Mariupol? That's a trade you have to take. And then third, it takes two to tango. And Putin is not interested in engagement. He likes isolation, and therefore pursuing engagement will lead to failure. Thanks. Thank you, Michael McFaul. <laughs> Next up, arguing no to the question, should we isolate Russia, is international economist and Russia affairs specialist, Jonas Scheinda. Emma. 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 Oh, excuse me, is Emma. <laughs> Emma Ashford. Thanks so much for, for having me, and thank you to the German Marshall Fund and Intelligence Squared. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk about this important question, um, albeit in COVID isolation upstairs. So my partner, Jonas, and I are going to argue that we in the West shouldn't isolate Russia. Um, we fully agree and acknowledge that there may be an excellent moral case for doing so, particularly given the barbarity of the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But we believe as well that there are many practical considerations in economic and political space that make it hard to believe that isolating Russia would be an effective approach for the West. Um, and I'm going to give three core reasons during, during this opening statement. Um, so the first is that long-term political isolation of Russia um, and economic isolation is going to bring significant costs here at home for domestic politics in Europe and the United States. We have already seen this as the economic impacts of the Western sanctions um, are contributing to falling standards of living, adding to inflation, and have produced backlash against incumbents in elections in France, have produced turmoil in, in governments in Bulgaria and Estonia, um, and the far right has often been the benefit of these policies. Um, so we believe that Western liberal values here at home may actually be seriously impacted by a strategy of economically containing Russia. A second point, long-term isolation of Russia is also likely to be negative for domestic politics inside Russia. We've repeatedly seen over the years with sanctions, various studies have shown that long-term sanctions regimes strengthen incumbents, weaken civil society, and allow authoritarian leaders from Kim Jong-un to Fidel Castro to blame outsiders for their own poor mismanagement. And we see in the last few months that this is what is happening inside Russia. Sanctions appear to be strengthening Putin's grip on power, not weakening it. And then a final political argument, we believe that ending the isolation of Russia as it is right now will actually be essential to a viable and lasting peace agreement over Ukraine. If Russia has no stake in a peace agreement, if they are excluded from European security in the longer term, they're more likely to reoffend. And we only have to look at historical examples to see cases where this came true. Consider Germany at the end of World War I, where the Versailles Treaty imposed a punitive peace that helped to fuel the, right, the rise of a far-right movement, helped to cause another devastating war. Um, but we also have positive examples of how to maximize containment and engagement together. Consider the Cold War. We saw leaders from Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher to others engage with the Soviet Union on key issues like arms control um, and international security, even as they contained them in other areas. So we believe that diplomatically isolating Russia, a more extreme policy than the one we pursued during the Cold War, is more likely to provoke backlash in this space. Um, and so just to sort of sum up, you know, it may be morally satisfying to isolate Russia, um, but policymakers have to consider the potential consequences of their actions. And the consequences of continued isolation of Russia after the war could be severe. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> Next up, arguing yes to the question, we should isolate Russia, is Radan Kanev. Thank you, David. And let me first thank the 
German Marshall Fund uh, and Intelligence Square for the rather undeserved honor to be here, which thrills me a lot. And then I will start with brief history remarks on the issue of integrating or isolating Russia. And I do it not because I love history, which I do, uh, but because Russia's regimes in multiple, and especially Mr. Putin particularly, are strongly preoccupied by history issues. And history is framing their political decisions quite often. So the, the West has, for centuries, has this uh, rather naive, even dangerous dream of integrating Russia into a rule-based international community. And sometimes the dream was fulfilled. Russia entered the international community in the end of the 18th century by taking the lion's share from the partition of Poland, and thus setting the pattern of its eventual integration attempts. Furthermore, Russia had at least two men on the moon moments in its integration in the international community, or I should rather say one Cossacks in Paris moment and one Bolsheviks in Berlin moment. After contributing in, in really great part to the military defeat of Napoleon and Hitler, Russia was first integrated as a main player in the so-called concert of powers in the 19th century and then became a permanent member of the UN Security Council in the 20th century. And regretfully, in both cases, Russia used this integration, this position, these new powers in order to subdue, oppress, and even try to erase a big part of Eastern Europe from the map of the world, and rather successfully. So I'm speaking very much from a European perspective, from an Eastern European perspective, or even South Eastern European perspective. And I think it is a very important one because Russian aggression is not a victimless crime. Every time there are victims, and from our point of view, the most important ones are those in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, although victims within Russia should not be underestimated. Since time is running out, I will use furthermore historic arguments, especially the one who loses and who wins when Russia's regime is humiliated, as Mr. Macron said, but we will do it during our debate. Thank you. All right. And last but certainly not least, Jonas Schenning. Well, I am pleased to be here. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Thank you to the GMF for hosting this conversation, the Intelligence Squared. Uh, I think it's a very important topic to discuss. And, of course, arguing the, uh, you know, reading the room and, and arguing the unpopular position, I think, is a little bit difficult. And I get it. You know, I get it. I get it. We want to respond to Russia. You know, much of this forum is about responding to Russia. There's Russia, it's doing things, We've got to respond. Okay, sure. But, you know, even the question of this debate, uh, should we isolate Russia, it connotes that we must believe that in fact such uh, isolation is possible to achieve. And, uh, you know, I just don't believe so. And here's why. A series of uh, really adverse economic actions were taken against Russia. And without giving much thought uh, to the destabilizing uh, practical impacts of such actions on the global economy. And, um, you know, these actions were, and we can say now, absolutely unsuccessful in forcing Russia to reverse course in Ukraine. So from this standpoint alone, uh, these, uh, you know, this policy of isolation has been ineffective. And that is the argument that I'm going to make today. In fact, I would say even more. Russia is winning because of this uh, economic isolation uh, policy. Uh, their, uh, you know, the, the income from energy uh, uh, doubled uh, for Russia uh, this year. Um, they have... 
a very strong fiscal position. Uh, they can spend all the money they have, and then and they you know they can have a lot of grain. They can they can do a lot of things, and they have a lot of resources uh, to go, uh, you know, to you know to use. Is Russia isolated? Well, I don't know. You tell me. Uh, its uh, oil exports to China doubled. To India grew by 650 percent this year, and uh, well, I think they're doing quite, quite well. Conversely, elsewhere we have a situation where everybody is feeling the pinch, particularly in in Europe. We have uh, a rising inflation, collapsing standards of living, and uh, the industrial base of of many European countries is built, and particularly in in Germany, is built on cheap energy from Russia. Without the energy, this base is, is eroding. Now, I would say, I would say more. There is one clear winner in this whole situation, and that is China. China's enormous resources, enormous labor pool, coupled now strategically with the, with the Russian energy, is going to probably, and I would say very likely, lead to the rise of a global competitor in Asia that Europe and North America, our alliance, will have a very difficult time to manage. It's time to get pragmatic, and I encourage you to vote against this resolution. All right, thank you very much, Jonas. And that concludes round one. We're debating the question, of course, should we isolate Russia? We're going to move now on to round two, which is the discussion. Now, the debaters will be taking questions from me from each other as well. I encourage you to essentially ask questions of yourself. So as I do not block Emma, I'm going to take a seat right here. That doesn't mean I'm joining your team, Jonas. But, uh, well, but I'll be sitting. a little suspicious to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be sitting right here. But you know, this is a, is a place where, where it's going to be more of a free-flowing conversation. We'll do Q&A from the audience afterwards. This portion will be the last 20 minutes, the next one about 15 minutes. Um, two teams arguing yes, Radan Kanev, Michael McFall, Jonas Scheindev on arguing no, obviously, and Emma Ashford. I'd like, I was going to start off this conversation with you, Michael. But in light of what Jonas said, I feel like I, I have to, to, to ask you some questions and sort of push back on this. So you said Russia is doing quite well. Mm -hmm. I wonder how you respond to, to questions of uh, estimations of 10 to 15 percent GDP decline, currency devaluations, and estimates across the military spectrum of, of wholesale decimation of many of their, their units. So if you can quantify how they're doing well a bit more for us. Well, if you talk about currency devaluation, and OK, I'm also a, a professor sometimes, uh, but I'm also a policy person sometimes. So I do math, OK? And uh, you know, we can have many opinions about uh, policy, what's effective, what's not, but math speaks for itself. Uh, the Russian Central Bank is lowering its interest rate specifically to devalue the currency. They have an enormous inflow of cash into Russia right now. They do not know what to do with it. Okay, there's so much of it. They try to lower the the uh, uh, the rate of interest so that the uh, the uh, uh, the ruble is depressed against the dollar, and they're failing. They're failing miserably. Uh, we are dealing now with a strengthening. A Russian ruble that makes uh, the imports cheaper for many Russian c uh, consumers and firms, and they're doing fine while we are dealing with historically high I inflation rates. Jonas, is that a short term or long term thing? What's going to happen a year from now to this mathematical statistics we just talked about? Well, in the long After run. cut off from uh, Europe for export. In the long run, we're all dead, but I. <laughs> I said a year from now, not a, I hope to be alive in a year, so how about in a year? Well, you know, I think we are dealing with different timelines here. And I fear, uh, I sincerely fear, that we might experience a sudden death uh, in our industry uh, capacity, in our standard of living. And if we don't reverse course, and my colleague already uh, mentioned this, it might lead, if you don't change the policy, then the policymakers will be changed. And, uh, and that is a grave danger for our political system, uh, our democracies that sustain our way of, way of life. Monica, do you want to respond to that? You just have to jump in. 
in so many ways. Uh, now that, oh, the clock's 17 minutes. I get 17 minutes? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's distribu distributed. Well, right. So yeah. a couple of things. The reason I asked that question is I think it's a very legitimate question. Uh, Russia has lots of money, the ruble's strong, uh, but whether that's a short-term effect of the lag time between cutting off energy versus not, uh, the G7 just announced a price cap uh, yesterday or today. That's coming. And so in the long run, I, it's a debate. I don't think in the long run Russia, Russia is better off because of these policies now. Um, and two, I think it's a historic decision that Europeans have made to get off of Russian cheap energy. I think in the long run, uh, Europe and the world and the climate, by the way, are all going to be better off from this isolation has stepped out. Short run, short run pain, long term benefit, I think, for Europe and the world. But number two, define Russia for me. The Russians. Putin, I got it. Putin's better. He's got this money. He's good. Is Nibulina better off right now? Is German Greff better off right now? Are any of the Russian businesses in uh, Russia, real private people, are they better off? Is Alexei Navalny better off? Who, who is benefiting from the things that you're talking about? Well, I think it is difficult to separate these kinds of things. I appreciate the question. Uh, when we talk about isolating Russia, I think we're isolating Russia wholesale. And that, uh, and I will let my, you know, my colleagues speak about that, that is a counterproductive uh, type of a, a policy. Many people were hurt, of course, in Russia, and uh, any policy has you know, multiple, multiple effects. But we're talking about uh, Russia as a regime, Russia as a country, and of course, many people who look at, at the stance uh, of hostility and hatred towards Russia, uh, many simple people, ordinary people, uh, they assume that it, uh, it relates to them as well. Now, of course, um, if, you let, if you look at the, at the budgetary picture in Russia, they have a very significant public sector. So when I said that, uh, that the public sector is very strong, that the budget is very uh, full, the coffers are full, that means that they're able to meet their budgetary obligations. And ordinary people, ordinary people, the teachers, uh, the doctors who are um, uh, public sector workers in Russia, uh, they're going to have their needs, you know, their needs met, and, uh, and they are not going to, uh, you know, rise up. And I think the kind of uh, magical thinking that we will inflict a lot of pain on Russia, and Russians will will rise up and carry Vladimir Putin out of Kremlin, or he will die of you know, cancer or something happens. Uh, all of that magical thinking uh, needs to be put to one side, and we need to engage Russia and engage uh, the Russian regime uh, in, in the matters of importance, not just to us, but also to the world. I want to take that point, because we are on the economic side of this argument here. There's another side, the more imper imperative, the, the, the peace process, and which Emma, you, you talked about quite a bit, but, but run on. A sort of a two-part question. One, when we talk about isolating Russia, is that feasible given Brazil's willingness to do business with Russia, India's willingness to do business with Russia, um, China's willingness to do business with Russia? And then the second part of that question, I mentioned this in sort of the opening statement, winter is coming. Europe relies heavily on Russian energy, and we've already heard about, Russian, about sanction, or, excuse me, rationing um, in Germany potentially. Bulgaria, your home country, is a country that has historic ties to Russia. So as you feel the pinch of these, these sanctions, uh, there's concern about how it might manifest politically as well. So given that two-sided approach, how do you do this when so many other countries are doing business with Russia? And how do you do this when so many of your citizens might be suffering as a result of it? So. Let's start uh, directly with, uh, with the question on countries doing business with, uh, with Russia. Uh, Europe is severely dependent on uh, your Russian energy supply. Uh, and this is no news. So here we have a huge problem as European policymakers. And the problem is we did not isolate Russia in 2014 when they annexed Crimea. And here I have something about 2014. So here is the ne European natural gas import from Russia. Here is 2014. Do you want to describe what you're selling just and for the radio audience as well? And here is 2020. 
Radha, do you want to explain what, yeah. you're, what you're showing? I'm showing a diagram of the European import of natural gas from Russia. So after Russia annexed Crimea, the Effectively share... it's going down, is what you're saying? No, it's going high. Oh, okay. It's going much, much higher. So Europe starts buying more. Instead of isolating the clear aggressor who annexed the territory of a sovereign country, we started, especially Germany and Italy, we started buying more gas and encouraging him for the next step. The share of Russian gas imports in Europe uh, r rose from 32 to like 40 percent of the European market uh, because we gave him uh, like uh, this price for invading Ukraine. Uh, but next, yes, we are dependent. We are overly dependent. But when it comes to natural gas, Russia is over 70 percent dependent on export to Europe through pipelines. Pipelines they don't have to China, and they obviously don't have to Brazil. And they have very, very poorly developed LNG technology, so they have nowhere to sell their natural gas mm. if we cut it off. We have strong weapons that we don't use, but then, of course, comes the moral argument, which I find much more important. We are in the midst of aggressive war. And if we do nothing, because the proposal indeed is to do nothing, then what comes next? My country, Bulgaria, Romania, or Moldova, like the last one who is not in NATO and who comes after Moldova? We don't have answer to this question. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it hurts to impose sanctions. But we are in a war. We don't want to engage the bully then we isolate the bully. I don't see the third way. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the moral aspect of this, because this is something I want to take to you, Emma. I mean, in, in your opening statement, you sort of t talked about the moral imperative in, in, in terms of uh, the humanitarian aspect of, of this. I'm wondering how you would respond to allegations, perhaps not toward you, but allegations of appeasement or conciliation in terms of, you know, if the transatlantic partnership does not act, than what we've seen in South Ossetia with Georgia, what we've seen earlier in 2014 with Crimea, and, and earlier incursions than Donbass and Luhansk. You know, if NATO is not willing to engage militarily, which seems clear, at least from a boots on the ground perspective, how do you respond to the question that isolation is sort of the next best move, or perhaps the first best move? You know, the argument that I, I started to make in my opening statement, I think, which is that containment and isolation are not the same thing. And I think we should be very clear about that. Deterrence and isolation are not the same thing. There are plenty of things that we in the West can do um, in order to militarily deter Russia from invading NATO countries, in order to help countries like Moldova or indeed Ukraine after this war to defend themselves and make themselves too difficult for Russia to take action against. But those steps don't necessarily involve isolating Russia, cutting it out from the global system. Um, and just to sort of go to this question of, of oil and gas, um, you know, I think you could make a good argument that Europe um, might be in a better place if it was not dependent on Russian gas or Russian oil. You know, you could make that strategic argument. But I think we should also be clear that what we are doing there, we would not necessarily be hurting Russia over the long term. Oil is fungible. It is easy to ship oil supplies elsewhere in the world. Gas supplies, um, as Radon noted, will take longer for new pipelines to be built. But my suspicion is that in the, the longer term, as, as you put it earlier, um, that those will shift as well. And what we'll end up doing is having sort of a game of musical chairs where we all pay higher costs. Um, and in five or 10 years, Russia is simply shipping the same resources to new customers for the same price. Michael, I wanted to, 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 to go to you on, on that specific point, but to sort of Because I have so many things I want you to go but, to. But to add, on, on, to add on to the, that question, <laughs> if, if the transatlantic partnership, if Europe has ended up paying for Russian gas, Russian oil, through a third party like India, and ends up paying a higher cost for, for that, but ends up still putting money in the coffers of Moscow, or if the European continent ends up buy, buying more energy from partners such as Saudi Arabia, which have their own history of human rights questions, then what are we really talking about here? Well, there's so many pieces of this that I disagree with. So first of all, it's not so easy 
to switch to oil and gas to other markets. Mm -hmm. Russia's paying a 30%, they're, they're getting back 30% less from that money. And to me, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, and that, that, I think, can continue with more isolation. Mm -hmm. If we don't provide insurance for those tankers, the price is going to go up. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. And remember, we're talking about we. We're not talking about isolating Russia from the world. You, you kind of blurred it when you talk about, well, we can't cut off from China and India. I don't care about that. Mm -hmm. Knock yourself out. It, you know, Mr. Putin, if you want to be a vassal of China, he always talks about you countries in this room being a vassal state of the United States. That's a phrase he loves, Vladimir Putin. If you want to do that at these reduced prices, it's really bad for you and your economy. I don't care about that. We're talking about us, yeah. we, right? That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Second thing is we have to run the counterfactual. We've been there and we've done that, right? 2008, we had exactly this debate in my country. I'm presuming we had it in other countries. And we decided, the Bush administration, not me personally, but they decided, oh, it's too costly to sanction Russia. We need them for X, Y, and Z. Oh, and we don't want to provoke the Russian bear. Oh, excuse me, I, I, I guess you should spin around, right? We don't want to provoke the Russian bear. We better not give them military weapons. Yeah. That's the debate the Bush administration had in 2008. Yeah. You mentioned 2014, same debate. I, and I, I had left the administration, but I had lots of friends in the administration that time. It was exactly the same debate. We can't sanction Russia because it'll hurt our consumers. And if we, if God forbid, we put javelins in Western Ukraine in storage spaces, that's what the mighty Trump administration did, by the way, when they said we didn't do anything. Yeah. That's going to provoke the Russian bear. Look where we're at, folks. It didn't work. So think about, had we sent HIMARS and isolation in 2008, maybe we would have avoided this horrible, barbaric, costly war. Let's leave, let's leave the norms out. I'm happy to talk about norms later, but just from our pragmatic national security interests, is this war in the interest of the United States? My answer to that is no. Had we isolated Russia, Putin's Russia earlier, maybe we would have avoided this catastrophic war. You said in the interest of the United States, Rod, and I just wanted to, to quickly go to your question with you. Does this risk a broader stratification of, of the global, global system, with Russia, several Russian banks being banned from the SWIFT system? Does this further along the de decoupling that we've seen between East and West, and what are the broader ramification consequences of that, if that's true? I don't think uh, economically, and uh, let alone politically isolating Russia, is really dividing the world uh, on West Bloc and East Bloc as it was. We are not in a new Cold War by a very simple reason. Today's Russia is in times weaker than Brezhnev's Soviet Union. Yeah. And still much, much more aggressive uh, on the international scene. And here I want to, to refer to Emma and what she said about President Reagan. My God, he did isolate the Soviet Union. Mm. He did isolate it for a very long period. He blamed it as an empire of evil, and I lived in communist Bulgaria back then. And my God, we felt very, very isolated. I had Uncle Sam with his nuclear weapons attacking my school every day in the school newspaper, you know. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a very tense situation. It was isolation, and it led to Reykjavik seven years later. So it, it took really, really, uh, uh, it was a long shot, and it took uh, a lot of expenses for defense. Uh, you remember the Star Wars, at least other people uh, like me, uh, and so on. So Reagan is a very good example in favor of what the West is doing now. All right, so I want to take one more question to you, Emma, maybe perhaps more than one. If not isolation, then what? A mixture of deterrence to prevent future Russian aggression against NATO or against other European countries, combined with some level of post-war engagement. Um, and something we haven't really talked about in the course of this debate is the, is the time scale that we're talking about. Um, I think, you know, the, there's, there's not a necessarily a great argument for changing course for the West this instant. Um, but in thinking about how we bring an end to the conflict, we should be thinking about how to build some engagement with Russia 
how to use the lifting of some of the sanctions that are in place to actually buy concessions to Ukraine at the negotiating table as this war ends, and then think about how in the long run we deter Russia. I think that's more effective approach, sort of a phased approach to ending the war and moving past it, rather than necessarily just talking about sticking with the approach that we have ad infinitum. Jonas, I want to ask you the same question. If not isolation, then what? Well, let me just tell you uh, that it's always fascinating to listen to tenured professors um, and, and bureaucrats uh, talk about... Which uh, one am I? <laughs> well, yeah, I think you're, both, both, both. both. No, but you know, I, I think it's it's fascinating to hear them say, well, you know, there's going to be a little bit of, an, of unemployment. There's going to be some uh, some hurt for the consumers. You know, let's just it's okay. It's worth it. There are you know people you know out there, real people who uh, you know millions of them are going to lose jobs. They're going to lose livelihoods, and this is a self harm. We're talking about um, about isolating. Uh, a country, and usually the isolation, you know, the sanctions, usually they work when the target is small. Uh, you, can, uh, you, you can deal with it more effectively. But when it's large, like Russia, uh, we heard yesterday that the size of the economy is like Spain or Benelux. That is very misleading, uh, because if you recalculate it with the, with the purchasing power of parity, then you're going to get to a $7 trillion. When you take a look at the Russian economy and realize that it's under uh, monetized, then you're going to get to nine and a half trillion dollars. That's not nothing. And uh, besides the size of the economy, besides the oil and gas, we're talking about uh, significant network effects uh, because Russia is is very uh, very much integrated into uh, into the the, com the commodity markets, the primary and secondary commodity markets. It's uh, it's number one on gas, number one on oil, fertilizer, number one, wheat, together with Ukraine, number one. Uh, a palladium, nickel, I mean, all of these things, uh, we need those things. And, 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 you know, and those commodities, uh, if you want to have the, the split in the world and, and, and a severe deglobalization into, uh, into the two worlds, the West and the rest, then it is quite achievable because oil is going to be consumed and gas will be consumed, just not here. And here we're going to have inflation and unemployment uh, and all those uh, all those things that, uh, that can uh, destabilize our, our society. So if not isolation, uh, a cooperation where it makes sense. I want to go for one last question here. Michael, I want to go to you on this. You can respond to what Jonas said. But I also want to throw something that's sort of the elephant in the room here is China. Does a, a move toward isolation on Russia Take the ball off China. Take, all, take the ball off the pivot to Asia that was started during the Obama years. No, just the opposite. And the idea that we're going to peel away Putin to contain China was a fantasy before the war, and it's a fantasy for the rest of the time that Putin's in, in power. So I think that's not a very interesting issue. Number two, I would just say there are many factors that lead to inflation and unemployment. Uh, to say that sanctions against Russia is the driver, I, I think there are a lot of economists that would disagree with that analysis, at least in my country. So remember, there's lots of things for, to that story. I agree with you, Jonas. We have we'll to think about those people. Huh? We come from the same country. No, but just different you're, you're not going to argue. You surely would not argue that the causes of American inflation today are the sanctions on Russia. That, that, there are many factors, including spending. Um, but, but I just I want to get to things I'm more an expert on. But I don't think that's the whole story. Uh, and I would just remind you that the American people actually do support isolation of Russia so far. Putin's Russia. So if we believe in the American people, we should support isolation. But I want to get to a much more bigger issue All that right, Emma raised. Wrap it up okay. because we're, we're almost right. out of time here. If, or we are if, out of time. If the <laughs> argument is we should be just like Ronald Reagan, as, as Emma kind of alluded to, then we are in agreement, Emma. I completely agree. Uh, but we need to know what historical metaphor that implies. Okay? Right. And, and I think there's a bit, maybe a bit of a dis disagreement about that. On engagement, it's chapter 27 of uh, George Shultz's memoirs. It's called Reengaging Realistically the Soviets. I know he was my neighbor for 30 years. And what he says there, and I, here maybe we agree, and I'm sorry if that violates your rules, but uh, on, <laughs> on nuclear weapons, on nuclear weapons, of course we need to talk to the Russians. And of course we need to follow on to the New START Treaty. Right. 
But on other things, he did. They put a lot of pressure on him. And then there was the, the George Shultz like to talk about the Pershing moment where they deliberately tried to push the Soviets to get a better deal. And I think that's the metaphor I, that's the metaphor I have in my mind. And the last thing I want to say, because I, I, I took issue with the word Russia, and, and Emma's right. I, I, I know the sanctions literature. I am an academic. I, I, I teach it. I would just say it's very complex. For all the times that it's failed, there are the, the, the case of South Africa. There is the case of Milosevic. It's complex. And my answer to that is, if you're worried about isolating Russians and the opposition, yeah. let's listen to what they want. And you know what Alexei Navalny wants? He wants more sanctions, more isolation of the Putin regime. And that's why I think we should be with Alexei Navalny on that very particular part of that question. Excellent. And finally, don't forget, Gorbachev came after all this period. If Putin was Gorbachev, this would be easy. Putin is not Gorbachev. I, I want to congratulate all of you, first of all, for maintaining the civility that, that, that during that exchange. It's, 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 it's part of, I think, the, the tone and temper of what we try to do in these debates is that we can certainly disagree and disagree with a certain degree of fervor and still maintain a certain degree of civility. I'm being told I've got a time for just one more question. So I want to pose this to you, Rana. This is a hypothetical question. If tomorrow Putin decided, you know what, we've, we've taken all the territory that we want, we've, we've carved out a portion of, the, of, of, of Luhansk uh, and the Donbass, war's over. Would isolation at that point stop for you? No. Uh, and it should not, because successful invasion of Crimea and our passive behavior led us here. Successful annexation of Donbass and our passive behavior will lead us to Kiev. Mm. And Kiev will lead us to Warsaw or to Bucharest or to Sofia. And that's something we cannot allow, whatever the economic price, by the way. I I told you we have one more opportunity, Emma, and I figured we'll, since you're, uh, you're coming uh, to us remotely from, from a hotel room here, you have the last word. Sure, yeah, let me make two points, I guess. So the first is that, you know, right on, you, you may be right about Russia's intentions, and you may be wrong. There's, there's no way to know this up front. Um, but even if you're right, it's not clear to me that economic isolation is the best way to deter Russia from future military action. Um, after all, sanctions after Crimea did not deter Russia from building up its military. It's very hard to deter any determined oil and gas exporter from doing so. Um, and just to add one point to what, what Jonas said earlier about the costs, um, we are talking primarily in this debate about whether the West should isolate Russia, and we've brought China into it. We haven't really talked about everybody else. And there are countries in sub-Saharan Africa, there are countries in the Middle East that are probably going to face famine over the coming years because of the isolation of Russia. And so we do also need to think about those impacts. Those impacts are not merely ones we're deciding for ourselves. They're ones that we are, through the way sac secondary sanctions work, imposing on other countries that may be far less able to cope with these impacts than we are. Okay. Thank you, Emma. We have now concluded the discussion portion of the, uh, of the forum, of the debate. Now we're going to go to Q&A. Uh, so as a reminder, we've got two teams of two here um, debating the question, should we isolate Russians? So we'll be passing the microphone around to anyone who wants to speak. So please, please say your name, stand up. When you ask your question, if you're, you're watching the live stream, you can do it in the chat as well. Um, let's keep these questions concise. Do make them questions, please. <laughs> a lot of statements at uh, forums like this, but make them in the form of a question. And, and also, this portion of the, of the debate is meant to move the conversation for, forward, so please don't debate the debaters. Okay. Should we, is that the gentleman over here? Hi there, John Emerson. My question is, is the food crisis that has been exacerbated by this war really the result of sanctions? or is it a result of the war and the actions of Vladimir Putin? Michael, would you like to take that? Yeah, absolutely. Vladimir Putin, that's easy. If we wanted to end the, that right now, the United Nations could get together and, and engage Vladimir Putin and open the port. Uh, it's not sanctions that's causing this, it's Vladimir Putin. And I, th I think that's, I, I don't know, I, I don't think that's a contentious issue. Uh, it's open the port in Odessa and we'll, we'll avoid famine. It's really that simple. I just, right. David, can I just jump in here for a moment? It's a combination of both. 
Um, you know, the Russian closures of the ports of Odessa and uh, in Ukraine are definitely a contributing factor, particularly to food shortages today. Um, but the question of whether fertilizer will get out to states, seed stocks will get out to states in the next year or two, that is much more to do with sanctions and the Russian response to the conflict. Um, and so it, it is in many ways a, a mixed um, cause, but the sanctions are certainly exacerbating it. Ukrainian prism and spending the last uh, five months as waking up with the air raids in Odessa, exactly. Um, I'm wondering why you're talking about isolation only from the perspective of oil and gas, but not speaking about all other sanctions involved, for example, to the double technologies, to the spare parts for the weapons and other stuff, as we already see how Russia cannot produce the new missiles or the tanks plant that being stopped, as a result causing the uh, uh, less shelling of the new missiles, but decompressing the old Soviet ammunition. So my question is why you're so much manipulating just with the oil and gas, forgetting about all other hundreds of type of sanctions that be in, in place or could be in place. So, so just to jump in here, so, so your question is just the focus on, on the energy within the debate itself? Sure. Good question, yeah. Yeah, do you want to take that? Uh, thank you, because it's right in my notes, and I forgot <laughs> I didn't have enough time. Three minutes is not a very much time. Is it in the American interest? I don't want to speak for the we, but is it in our national security interest to sell uh, chips to Russia, right? Uh, my answer is no. It's not in our national interest. And had we taken to isolate Russia from that technology, to cut them off uh, back in 2008, your country might be in a much better position today. And I want to be crystal clear. There are moral arguments for the reasons that I, I believe what I'm arguing here. But purely from the, the national security interests of my country, uh, uh, and, and I'm not speaking on, uh, for your country, I'm speaking about the we, I think, well, I should be careful. I don't know what the, just, I never was not quite sure. Am I re talking about the United States or everybody? It doesn't matter. The we is a transatlantic partnership. Well, so yeah. uh, then Ukraine is part of that. That's why, uh, and therefore, th then, therefore, the we is us. Would we have been better off or worse off had we cut them off from those chips in 2008? My answer is we would have been better off, and we should have done it then, and we most certainly should do it for the long-term future until, and I, and I ended my, I want to be clear, I'm all for engagement uh, of, of a post-Putin Russia and a democratic Russia. Uh, just not now, to Emma's question about timing. And so for, and I could go through the, I could go through the banks and, and the other sanctions, but I think it's a very important point. We're, we're, it's not just about energy, it's about the full range of sanctions that have been put in place. Jonas, do you want to respond to that before we move on? Well, what's the question, exactly? Uh, the, you know, giving a, a Russia chips. A, a chips and technology I think a lot of this is a technological you know, question, and, uh, and we need to take a look at this you know, specifically one by one. Uh, what we are talking about here, I think, is isolation that is wholesale, right? And that kind of a wholesale isolation of Russia has negative impacts on us. And the self-harm is something that we need to consider. If we don't consider it, uh, then it's just bad policy. And when it comes to the standards of good policy, no less a person uh, than President Barack Obama, your former boss, uh, summarized it uh, quite eloquently. Don't do stupid stuff. Um, he, well, he didn't say stuff. He said other words. Uh, <laughs> well, he's the president. He can do that. Uh, but did we really think this through? And I would contend that no, we didn't. All right, please. Just say your name and stand up if you can. Yeah, the question was, uh, should we isolate Russia? And I'm questioning, can we isolate Russia? Uh, and thinking about um, how he looked um, Putin at the BRICS summit last week, the Africans and the Indians, doesn't look too isolated on uh, the world stage. They don't look very convinced by the offers made so far by the transatlantic community. The coercion, the persuasion doesn't seem to be working even in Africa. So my uh, question is, what can be done uh, to bring uh, these other parties, uh, the rest of the world that didn't really enter this debate uh, very forcefully until right at the end when Emma mentioned it. How do we bring them on side? They're part of this isolation strategy, surely. You know, I want to, you know, interest in keeping the debate moving along, this, this question was a asked earlier on in the debate. So, so um, in respect for you, I do want to keep the, the debate moving. Please. 
Um, yeah, hi, my name is Sandra Kadori, Keeping Channels Open. Um, I just wanted to ask about the psychological level, the naming and shaming of the diplomatic isolation, kicking out from the Human Rights Council, Council of Europe, and also the, all the war crimes investigations. Uh, psychologically, humiliating Putin doesn't, or naming shaming doesn't seem to work, but would it work with people around him, um, the Russian, the elite, the oligarchs, the military, the other politicians or the soldiers? So the naming and shaming, who's it going to work with? Ranan, I'd like you to take this question. He would. Yes, uh, very briefly. Psychologically, only military loss affects Russia. Uh, they don't have moral scruples on this level of government. We cannot expect any blaming and shaming to do the job. And we've seen Russia many times reforming as the result of a military defeat. And we've seen Russia many times unsuccessfully reforming inside, but at least letting subdued people go as a result of military defeat. It was the same after the Crimean War, when the serfs in, in Russia were liberated as a part of the post-war reforms. It was the reforms after the Japanese War, which they miserably lost. So you're saying they have uh, to lose and they have it, to be it humiliated was, for reforms It was to half place? of Eastern Europe, <laughs> all the Baltics, Poland, Bessarabia, uh, returning to their independence as a result of their miserable loss in the First World War. Yeah. And it was my country being free as a result of their failure in Afghanistan. Let them lose the bloody war. Mm. Can I just add a footnote? Please. So um, I've actually negotiated with Mr. Putin uh, in the government. I was in the government for five years. I met him in 1991, so we go way back. We're not Facebook friends, but I, I've known <laughs> the guy for a long time. Uh, and I just... I, I, and I actually think this is true about diplomacy generally, but I can't generalize from a case of one. I can only talk about when I was in the government as a diplomat and at the White House. I think we tend to way overestimate these words about humiliation, hurting his feelings. If we just talk to him nicely, he's going to do a deal. That is not how diplomacy, when I was in the government, works with Russia. It's actually not the way diplomacy works with France either, by the way, in the United <laughs> States or Germany. Um, uh, it's about interest. To, to sound like the realist in the room, it's about interest. And so no engagement, happy talk, let's not humiliate them. None of that will matter to get a peace settlement in Ukraine. The only time the permissive condition, the necessary condition for a peace settlement in Ukraine is for Putin's army to not be advancing. Yeah. And until that happens, everything else is, 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 is just is, is ephemeral to the event. Um, and that, that's why I think this engagement, isolate, I, it, should, it has to be tied to a concrete objective. When the objective is better relations with Russia, that's a really bad strategy. You know, what, what I want to just follow up on that because what I heard in the undercurrent of that question, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that there might be a danger having a country more isolated. You know, if you look back at a, a reference to the Second World War, Oil uh, embargoes against Japan were a pre pre precursor to Pearl Harbor. So, you know, this context of if you are more isolated, then you're more protected, is that, is that accurate? Or but, but, are you made more dangerous? Well, compared to what? You're from Ukraine, right? Feels pretty dangerous right now, doesn't it, uh, Mr. Putin? So this notion that he, you know, if he, he, we trap him in the corner, then he's going to do really crazy things? I just think we overestimate that. Uh, and I, could, I don't want to burn up all the time. I could go through the strategic nuclear one, the... the, 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 the well, before we get to that, I just want to give okay. Emma a chance to, to jump in here. Yeah, thanks, thanks, David. I appreciate it. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I want to go back to what I, I heard was the undertone of the, the last question, which is, can we isolate Russia? Um, and, you know, I think it's not so much about, you know, the impacts of naming and shaming or even kicking Russia off of, you know, the Human Rights Council. Um, the, the question is whether doing this actually advances our interests. And I think there's a couple of reasons to think that, that it may not. Um, we are seeing that Russia is still very welcome in other forums around the world. Yes, you know, the BRICS, but there have also been bilateral trips to India. There have been um, negotiations between Russia and the Gulf states through the OPEC plus arrangement. Russia is maintaining many of its non-Western political ties and engagements. Um, and we are, I think, kidding ourselves if we think that we can really cut that off. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I don't have this picture of engagement as being some happy thing where, you know, we all go for a picnic with Mr. Putin and we're friends. That's, that's not what diplomatic engagement is. Diplomatic engagement is about states achieving their interests. And right now, much of the rest of the world is telling us that even if we try to isolate Russia, they're not willing to do it. Okay, we've got about three minutes and 50 seconds left. We might have time for one or two more questions. I want to go to this woman here in the blue. Hello, Teresa Fallon, Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. I want to ask this learned panel, what if you said move this further along, what about the Arctic? I mean, if we see a, a very weakened Russia, how is this going to affect geopolitics with a strengthened China and Russia kind of entente? What will this mean for security in this region and geopolitics in the future? I might add space onto that one as well. Well, David, if I could just take Please. a very quick first go at this. Um, you know, I think one of the, the risks that we are seeing here is that by pushing Russia out of international forums, by suggesting that it shouldn't be in the Arctic Council, um, by trying to keep, you know, negotiations on space or on other issues inside institutions that are primarily Western in their orientation, again, as Jonas said earlier, we are advancing towards a point where we might see more of a bifurcation globally. Um, if you value those liberal institutions as a place for states to come together and resolve their differences, you don't want them to become seen as only a place for Western states to come and basically decide what they're going to do to the rest of the world. That's a very damaging image, and it's not one that I think we really want to pursue. Michael, I want you to respond to that real quickly, because I, even at the very height of the Cold War, there still were avenues in which Moscow and Washington were collaborating. The Arctic is certainly a, an excellent point of that. And space, as it becomes right. more and more front and center in terms of what the Chinese are doing, what the Russians are doing, what the Americans in the private sector are doing, right. how does that collaboration work forward if you're advocating for isolating Russia? Well, I want to be very clear. Part of the premise of the debate is we're focusing on a strategy. We're not focusing on national security interests or international interests, right? And I think the strategy has to line up for what you're seeking to achieve. So during the Cold War, we engaged with the Soviets on arms control. That was good. I support that. And if, that bio, if, I'm, if I have to go sit on that side of the chair to say that, I still support that. I believe we should have a, a treaty to replace the new START treaty. Right. But I don't believe blanket engagement, I, I think our, 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 our opponents have to spell out exactly what they mean. For the You asked the question, but I, I think we should ask it again. Well, what is this alternative world? Because when we talk about the liberal international order, I agree, it's states should come together to, to, to resolve their uh, differences and win-win outcomes. But when you violate grotesquely one of the core norms of that very international system, why did we set it up? To stop annexation in Europe. And, and so we're just going to say, well, now that the war's over, come back in, Volodya, you know, let's bygones, uh, let's just all sit down and negotiate. I actually think that undermines our ability to achieve our long term goals of preserving the liberal international order, of preserving democratic values. I actually think that serves our interests. I don't think it's just some namby-pamby, wouldn't it be nice to have values? No, I actually think values is one of the core things we have vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis other autocratic places, especially the Europeans in the room. We've got a little bit of a problem with democracy in my country right now. Um, uh, so that, to me, that's the trade-off. You have to, you guys keep saying there's a trade-off. I, I think it's, it's right. The inflation versus sanctions, but tell us the trade-off you're willing to do. You're willing to go shake hands with a guy that's going to annex 20% of Ukraine in the name of what? To not isolate him? That is a trade-off that I don't think is worth taking. Ron, and I want you to have the last word here. Is there an area of cooperation um, or, or a carve-out in this isolation um, um, strategy that you would get on board with? And would you get on board with if circumstances and situations on the ground started to change? Uh, first of all, Russia obviously exists, so areas of cooperation will always be there. Isolation doesn't only mean sanctions, but isolation doesn't mean war. And one thing we want to achieve through isolation is not having war with Russia, because they're obviously crazy enough to go even there. But we are, thanks God, we are not. Of course, there are fields 
of where cooperation could be and would be needed. For example, what was proved to be effective with Mr. Putin in, uh, in the early years of this millennia with the war against terrorism, he was an ally back, back then, at least until Iraq, which was our, your mistake. <laughs> so, uh, of course, there, there are certain possibilities. And, of course, this conflict will be settled at a certain point somehow. And I hope that through economic pressure and through providing the weapons needed to Ukraine to defend itself, obviously more than now is, is needed, uh, the war could be over by economic exhaustion of Russia because it won't be the first time Russia loses wars because of economic exhaustion. It will be the fifth or tenth time every time they do it because of this. So this one, we need the same result. Okay, and that concludes round two of this debate. Uh, I just want to thank the audience here for some of your great questions and the debaters for keeping it civil and having the kind of exchange that, that we might expect of this kind of forum. Uh, we're going to go to closing arguments now. This is your last opportunity to convince the audience and the millions of people ar around the world, particularly within the United States, where this will be broadcast on NPR, that your side is right. So first up, closing arguments, two minutes in length, Radan Kanev, should we isolate Russia? Thank you. So, what I heard from our honorable opponents are mainly two arguments. The bully is far too strong, so we'd better accommodate him. And the bully is doing quite fine economically. So, I will end this debate from my side with an example from my own country. We have strong pro-Russian feelings in Bulgaria. We have very strong economic ties. And all the way around, we tried to accommodate. We built the Turk stream. We opposed European sanctions. We declined the possibility to send weapons directly to Ukraine. All about accommodating. The final result was that we were the very first European country to have its gas supply cut off. That was the result of accommodating. And then, just final sentence about the economic well-being. After our gas was cut off, we still pay our debts. And Russia yesterday defaulted on its. That's it. Efficient. Next up, arguing uh, whether we should isolate Russia is Jonas Scheinder. So, you know, we talked very well, uh, and you probably know what I'm going to say already, uh, but I'm not going to say that. <laughs> what I'm going to say is this. Um, you know, Putin's, they come and then they go, right? But, the, but Russia remains, and Russian people remain, and with all this talk and excitement uh, about the, the, the hostility and mistrust uh, towards Russia, I think the, it's very easy to lose the forest behind the trees. That the relationship that needs to be built needs to be built not so much with Putin, and we need to consider the rest of Russia and Russian history. Now, you were behind uh, right on, uh, the Iron Curtain, and you felt isolated. Uh, I was behind the Iron Curtain too, I, uh, and I remember. Um, I remember, uh, you know, uh, behind the Iron uh, Curtain reading uh, the American Constitution. Uh, that stuff, you know, it hits you like a ton of bricks. It's very important, and it's very inspirational. And I was inspired, and I was forever inspired by the American Constitution, and by the values encapsulated in it. And right now, I don't know. I don't know what a six-year-old kid is going to do in Russia when people uh, like my honorable you know, colleagues um, say that Russia is bad, not Putin is bad. Russia needs to be isolated, not Putin needs to be isolated. We need to disengage with Russia uh, and with the Russian people. I don't know if that's good for strategically building the relationship so that we can invite Russia into the family of nations where the people in Russia see the West not as the enemy, but as a friend and as a destination 
for their democratic ideals. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jonas. Next up, Michael McFall. You have the floor. I didn't know there was a third round. I thought we were done. Um, <laughs> Jonas, you and I agree on a couple of things. First of all, I disagree Putin comes and goes. I think this notion that, that countries behave in certain ways because of their culture and history, the last 30 years of the Soviet history and Russian history don't support that hypothesis. I already said Putin is no Gorbachev. Uh, he's also no Yeltsin. He's even not a, a Medvedev. I think this notion that Russia is this way because Putin's that way, I radically disagree with. And in, in response to how Russians are feeling, I deliberately named two state actors, Nibulina and Gref. They don't like this war. The good people. I, I, I'm, I'm agnostic if they're good All or right. bad. I know them. But, but the notion that, they're, that, that this is a good thing and they survive, I don't think, I can't think of anybody that thinks this war is a good thing. Nikolai Patrushev, there's one guy I think that thinks this war is good. I don't know of anybody else in Russia that thinks it's good. But I want to get to your fundamental point, which where we do agree. Uh, this is a tragic debate for me personally, right? I, I, I lived in the Soviet Union. I was part of trying to integrate Russia into the West, uh, trying to build democracy there in the 90s. Um, and we're here at a very tragic moment, I think, in world history. And for me personally, I have thousands of Russian friends uh, who have six-year-olds, by the way, who are cut off. Uh, and, and this is a tragic moment for them and for us. But I just think it's naive to think that we're gonna bring Putin back in and everything's gonna be fine. We did that, we tried that. He saw that as weakness. And that's the way he'll see it again. In part, that's why this war is here. Because he saw weakness in 2008. He saw it in 2014, in Syria 2015, and he expected it again now. So now we have the right response. Let's do it for the long haul, especially for those six-year-olds. Because they should be integrated in a post Putin, Russia, and, and we get back to the business of integration, but not while Putin's in power. Okay, thank you, Michael. And last, but certainly not least, Emma Ashford. Well, I'd like to start by thanking my fellow debaters for, for what is, I think, a difficult conversation and a difficult question. Um, and so, you know, I could end here by telling your arguments again, right? I could tell you that it's not possible to isolate Russia. I could point to $5 gas prices. I could point to the fact that support in the United States has dropped 15% for punishing Russia in a month. Um, I could point to the fact that it's going to carry significant costs for the US, for the rest of the world, um, costs that I believe will come in values, not just in economic terms. Um, or I could point out that there are, there are other ways to handle Russian aggression, um, or that even that I don't necessarily think that isolating Russia is actually going to change the regime, as, as Michael has sort of implicitly suggested. But I guess I would just end with what I think is the most important argument here, and it's this. You know, wars are horrible. The war in Ukraine is a brutal, barbaric, awful, unnecessary war. But wars rarely end through absolute victory by one side. And we need to think about a durable peace and how we achieve it. And so I would argue that instead of isolating Russia forever, we should be thinking about how to use the measures that we've taken so far as a bargaining chip to get to a peace deal and to build a more durable peace afterwards. Excellent. All right. And that concludes round three. Now it's time to find out who argued best. So you're going to see a QR code that's going to pop up right behind me, just like uh, in the beginning. And you can scan that again, and it's time to cast your second vote. Now, you've heard the arguments. The question before us is, should we isolate Russia? And now, while you're tabulating, uh, or while we're tabulating th those votes, I'd like to welcome, welcome back uh, Vice President of the German Marshall Fund, Ian Lesser, and the CEO of Intelligence Squared, Clay O'Connor. Hello. Hello. Uh, hello <laughs> again. Go over here. Okay. <laughs> so as, as we start to tabulate these votes, Ian, I wanted to, to start with you. This is the first form that we've that you've put on um, since 2019, the first in-person person forum with the, uh, with the German Marshall Fund here in Brussels. Why is it so important? I mean, the, the purpose of, I mean, as great as Zoom 
connections can be in terms of connecting us all around the world. Why is this sort of the rubbing shoulders and being in, in person so important? We were talking about this a little bit earlier. It's a super question. And, you know, actually, it would be a wonderful question for a debate. Does in-person <laughs> matter, right? Um, my answer to that so. would be yes. <laughs> I, I think I hope you all share that view. Uh, it, it really does matter. I mean, imagine having this discussion, and it worked very well with Emma. Uh, but, you know, imagine having this discussion purely virtually. It's simply not the same thing. Uh, so that's a very basic, you know, sort of reason. But I mean, the more profound reason is we're getting together a lot of people who uh, have missed each other, have missed having these conversations in person. Uh, they simply are different. And there's a lot that goes on on the margins of Brussels Forum uh, that uh, you can't capture virtually. Right. So it's a huge asset. So if we want to have a debate about it, <laughs> I, would say, I would say the virtual formats that we developed during COVID enabled us to reach far more people than we had been able to before. So I think for relationship building and for this room, policymakers, experts, it's hugely important for us to be able to reach the general public and actually have the free exchange of ideas in a bigger, broader way. The virtual format works pretty so, well. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to split it down the middle and say that's why we do things in a hybrid way. <laughs> like today, this was our first hybrid debate, actually. Yeah, and that's it, true. It, the, the German Marshall Fund team pulled it off beautifully. And so did you. No, oh, thank you. I, to that point about policymakers, I mean, we, I mentioned this in sort of my opening statements. NATO is right down the road here. You know, policymakers are, are rendering decisions on this very topic and how we all sort of move forward in this. Clay, this question is more for you, not only in terms of the content of what you heard tonight, but in terms of the format. What, I mean, why is, why is debate, in, in terms of your, your perspective, a way to sort of elicit some of these, these, these perspectives that you might not get otherwise? I think it should inform the decision-making process for policymakers. You're bringing both sides together mm -hmm. for a transparent, unscripted, real conversation. And that's how we're going to arrive at finding solutions to these big problems. So if there's one takeaway that I'd want to leave as the person running a debate company, it's that we'd love to see more debates. We'd love to see more debates coming from our elected officials, from our public officials, from our policymakers. Um, and there's all these tools now, like we just discussed, to make them, make them more available. Ian, what, what's different about this session compared to past sessions that you've had? Not, not just the fact that we're, we're kind of emerging out of this pandemic. We see sort of a scattering of some masks in the audience, some not. Is this okay? Is well, it not? You know, look, I mean, I think what, it goes back to the, the point I think we were making earlier when we were chatting. Uh, there's something about this combination of this forum in this place with these audiences and the format and the debate style that you've got uh, that adds value. Uh, it, obviously, for the two organizations, but I think for everybody in the room and for the audience that consumes this, I mean, it's not so usual to have this. And it's not only a very civil debate, I mean, that's always pretty much the case here, uh, but it's a nuanced debate. Mm. And it engages people. And I can see people nodding and writing and, and all of this kind of thing. And, and that's, that's, one, that's one metric. And as people are scribbling away, if they take away one good idea that they bring back to their uh, official capacity, whatever it is, or to their work, whatever it is, uh, that's a success. Yeah. I learned something coming into to this debate. Radan, you, you don't debate in parliament. Is uh, that? The European parliament, no, no real debate. No real yeah. debates. We speak from the rostrum, but it's not a real debate. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did here today is a real debate, and hope we, we learned a lot more from it. Um, and, and just to say, we will also be releasing this debate July 22nd mm -hmm. on NPR um, all over America and making it available on all of our networks. And to that end, do subscribe to Intelligence Squared so we can stay in touch um, and, and share this debate broadly with all your constituents. You know, I, I wanted to say something in terms of the taxonomy of these, these debates. One of the things that we look for when we're putting these things together is two people on one side that might be coming at something from, from a, a different perspective. So, so Michael, you as a, as a former ambassador, an American. Radan, you a parliament member. Jonas, you as someone who, who grew up in the Soviet Union, but also coming out from an economics background. And Emma, wherever you are. Um, <laughs> you bring in that political science aspect of this and also sort of the cross-border side of the analysis. So, you know, in doing this, we, we sort of look to bring sort of that texture. And that's kind of why you don't see this as 
This is not the shouting match that you might see on cable news. This is meant to be a nuanced discussion and certainly fit for this forum. And the questions that, that all of you answered today were, were quite fascinating. But, but Ian, I wanted to, to bring it to you. In terms of this debate, was there something that stuck out at you in terms of the, the nature of it, be it editorial in, in focus or just simply the structure of how, how we put this on? You know, I was very impressed with the debate. There were a lot of things that were said that were very, very useful. I had my own little notepad, and I was saying, ah, I don't agree with that, or I agree with this, or you know, what I would say differently, or whatever it is. I think you know, the question of being able to think in time about this question is extremely important. It's one thing to talk about it with the immediacy of what we're facing right now. It's quite another to think about it in terms of containing, deterring, dealing with, engaging, if that's what you want to do, with Russia you know, a decade from now. Uh, you know, and so if I were to have made a point, I would have made a slightly different one. I would have said, I'm not sure who this, I guess it su probably supports the proposition, but anyway, I would have said, uh, look, do we want the vulnerability and exposure that we have today to this integration with Russia on energy, but not just energy? Yeah. Or do we want that to be less? I would say less. But anyway, I don't, I didn't vote. So there <laughs> well, it is. Fair enough. I didn't either. Fair, fair enough. enough. <laughs> one thing I, I was hoping you could discuss, Claire, before we get into the results of this, is one of the things that I find so refreshing about this format, and especially about the way um, these things are carried out and the nature of the vote, is that it encourages a changing of minds. So I said this in the very beginning of our conversation, or at the beginning of the debate, that you, you want, we want you to come with an open mind, because so much of what you see in the media, what you read, what the conversations even you might have over dinner during your respective holidays are entrenched positions and individuals trying to tell you why they're right or vice versa. And this context, this forum is, is the, the antithesis of that. We really want to, to engender this sentiment of, of being open-minded. And I know that from my experience, people coming sort of after, after the show and, and up to me, there's almost like this effervescence of, oh my God, I never thought about it that way. And, and I, I was hoping you might be able to just discuss a little bit about the nature of, of changing minds and sort of that intractability that so many of us feel. Well, we don't have an agenda, you know, in this. We're totally nonpartisan. We're a nonprofit organization. But we do believe debate is a vehicle to learn how to think, not what to think. So you make up your own mind, but in this process, in airing out the two sides, even in just coming to a consensus on the definition of the terms that we're using and hearing a lot, this is, this is a tool in the toolbox to like get to how we arrive at conclusions and why. So, I mean, I think it's a pretty powerful format. We need more of it in education. We're working a lot on that, you know, behind the scenes. Um, but would just kind of encourage you to, to maybe even take this format, because you went to Oxford. This is an Oxford-style debate, which means active listening is probably the most important function, is really giving your opposition time to express their ideas, really think about them, and respond to those specific points, not ad hominem attacks. You didn't see any of that today. You didn't see any talking over each other. You didn't see anybody avoiding any questions. And that's really a testament to the debaters on this stage who are really courageous to stand up in front of the world and take on this motion. And I think they deserve an extra special round of applause for that. Thank you, Clea. All right. Thanks, David. All right. Thank you very much. We have the results. The moment's all you've been waiting for. So remember, what we're looking for is the difference between the first and the second vote to see who has changed the most minds. And here it is. The motion, should we isolate Russia before the debate, in live polling of this audience, 65% of you agreed with the motion. 17% were against. And 18% were undecided. Those are the first results. Now remember, what we're looking for is the difference between that first and second vote. How many of you have changed your minds? And here are the results. So, for the team arguing in support of motion, the first vote, 65. <laughs> Second vote is 66. <laughs> the side won percentage points. Now, to the other side, how many of you did they sway tonight? Let's see. The team arguing against the motion, the first vote was 17%. The second vote was 31%. That side pulled up 14 percentage points. That's enough. The team who argued no to the motion, should we isolate Russia, change the most minds. But remember, that's just the vote tonight. We're going to keep this vote open. 
um, to our broader audience in terms of the broader listening audience on National Public Radio, on podcasts, and online. And so millions of listeners all around the country, all around the globe, will have a chance to, to vote and weigh in on this incredible debate. So I just want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you to the debaters for having a wonderful conversa uh, conversation. And thank you to the audience here for participating and keeping it civil. From all of us, Intelligence Squared, good night. Thank you. David, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was really super. I, and I hope you'll all agree. Um, if, I could, if I could just get your attention for a moment. If I could just get your attention for a moment. Um, we now have a, a set of breakout dinners, actually 11 of them. Uh, and there are wonderful restaurants in Brussels, and you may have made your own arrangements. But if you sign up for one of the breakout dinners, you'll find out which of the 11, you probably know already, or should know already. But anyway, to remind yourself, if you look on the back of your badge, you'll find a number. Uh, and when you go outside, you'll find people who will help you find that dinner. Uh, they're all over Brussels, actually. So please do, please do follow their directions. Um, and it's very important that you go to the one that you signed up for. So uh, enjoy those dinners. They're always wonderful. They're off the record, and they're very lively. And they're usually very good restaurants, too. So thank you.